breakfast, brushed his teeth, you know, packed his briefcase, got in his car every morning, strategically right on time, you know, rode right down to where the ferry came. He got on board the ferry. It crossed every morning to the business district where he would get off punctually, walk smartly to his office up to the 11th floor, open up his briefcase, set everything out on his desk at 8 a.m. every morning. Never miss. Not 7.59, not 8.01, always right on the mark, 8 a.m., set everything out. Until one morning he woke up late, 15 minutes late, freaks out, gets up fast as he can, you know. He, he, he panic-stricken, he rushed through the shire, rushed through shaving, nicks himself, puts the little piece of toilet paper on there, you know, and does everything he can to get into the car and run down to the... As he pulls into the ferry parking lot, he notices the ferry is just feet off the dock there. And so he gets out of the car, grabs his case, runs as fast as he can, makes a flying leap, and lands on the deck of the ferry, you know, and out of breath, to which the captain looks down at him and says, man, that was a tremendous leap. If you'd just waited another minute, we'd have reached the dock and you could have walked on. <laughs> so anyway, we get a little messed up and they mess with our time. Amen. It just kind of throws everything out of sync. I said last week, it was the last sermon on that particular series, Battle Ready, but hey, you never know. You to just be ready for whatever. As I sought to move forward, I just felt like I needed to stay here one more sermon and close out this whole Battle Ready. In this series of message. Don't freak out if you weren't here for any of your guests of ours day. It all fits together anyway. We've been speaking on the armor of God and putting on the whole armor of God. We went through all the elements of it. And then last week really focused in on uh, not what the armor was, but what we're to do with the armor. And all those verbs within that passage in Ephesians, you know, chapter 6, where he talks about taking on the whole armor of God. And talking about just standing in, in, with an attitude of faith, believing God and trusting God. Uh, but I want to talk today about this, this whole idea of once we are armed, our responsibilities, once we are prepared for battle in our life, we've suited up and we're ready. And I want to talk about the idea of conquering. In fact, the Bible calls us super conquerors. Now, I want to go back to something that we used to do in our fellowship many, many years ago. And I'm trying to remember when we stopped doing this. It's taken from the Old Testament where the people of God would stand for the reading of the word. And it particularly happened in the Old Testament when there had been a famine in the land for the Word of God and it had not been read in a long time openly to the people of God. And the scrolls were discovered. Was it under Hezekiah? I don't remember. But the scrolls were discovered and he called all the people together for the reading of these, the lost Word of God. And as they came together, all the people rose to hear the Word of God. Well, like I said, I don't know when it was that we stopped doing that and standing for the reading of the Word of God, but somewhere over the years that happened. But I think... We're back in a place where there is a famine for the Word of God in the land today. Amen. And Hosea prophesied in the last days there would be a famine for the Word of God. So let's stand together as we read the Word of God. And I'm reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 17. In case you had not had time to open it, we'll be on the big screen for you, all right? Now, when I came to trust for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord... I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus, my brother, but taking leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, you might want to circle that but thanks be to God part, who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us a sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we're an aroma from death to life to death and to another aroma from life to life and who is adequate for these things for we are not like many peddling the word of God but as from sincerity but as from God we speak in Christ and in the sight of God well, let's, you may be seated as we look at this passage today you say how does this relate to the armor of God well this is a great illustration of a man who's given us already this this instruction about the armor of God who's experiencing this in his own life right now I think all too often when we get all suited up for victory in the Lord, uh, we just expect that all of a sudden things might be different. Well, unfortunately, things don't change. It's us that should change, all right? And we're constantly being changed. We're constantly allowing God to work in us and, and, and deal with our lives and grow us into a place of, of, uh, of maturity in our life. And so often I think we realize uh, that the world hasn't changed. We should be realizing that we're changing. But I want you to, to understand this morning 
This whole idea of victory where he's talking about here, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph, who leads us in victory, that that's a pretty powerful statement that he's making there. And, we, and what I want to focus on today is just what is that victory and what does it mean to us in the Christian life and really even what that victory is not. Far too often, I think we talk about things like spiritual warfare and the armor of God. And we, get, we get equipped, so to say. But then we go out into the battlefield of living our life every day and we experience a lot of disappointments. If you follow the storyline here, Paul's talking about in his missionary journeys, he was expecting to go to Trous, meet Titus, and they were going to do some ministry work there. And then they'd move on to Macedonia. But the circumstance did not turn out at all like Paul had thought it was. In fact, when he gets there, he said, there's this anxiety, there's no peace, there's, no, there's this nothing but a restlessness in my spirit. And it's interesting that you catch this story here because it really speaks against the, the mindset of our culture today. We think that if we're doing what God wants us to do, then the circumstances will all line up perfectly. And that's not the way it happens in real life, is it? In fact, there are very many disappointments. There's, there's times when we have set expectations in our own mind or heart of the way things will be or should be. And when we get there, it's not like that at all. It's, it's not according to our expectation. Unfortunately, what happens in a scenario like that is we bail out. Instead of being persistent and consistent, we kind of back off. We get discouraged. And as we talked about dealing with the armor of God, that shield of faith that's supposed to quench those fiery darts, uh, we just lay it down because of the discouragement and then the fiery darts come in. So often we just really don't have an understanding of what this whole idea of victory really is and therefore a lot of people don't live in the victory. They don't experience the victory. They don't walk in victory. But I want to kind of clarify some things I think will help you as you're getting suited up in your armor to experience the victory the Lord has for you. Let me give you some shocking news. And if you've been around here long at all, it's not too shocking. I've said it a thousand, billion, million, hundred times, all right? But when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you received everything that you need to be successful as a believer in Christ Jesus. The moment you gave your life to Christ. Look at this verse in 2 Peter 1. It says, His divine power, and this is past tense, has granted to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who's called us to his own glory and excellence. Let me put that in simplified English for you. When you receive Christ Jesus, God gave you at the moment of your salvation everything you would need. He has granted to you all things that pertain to life and to godliness. In other words, the day I gave my life to Jesus, God gave me what I needed in that instance to be a godly man. He gave me what I needed in that instance to, to live for his glory. In other words, it's, it's like physical birth. When I was born that first time, before I was born again, got to be born the first time, obviously, God gave me at birth everything I would need to be, to be an adult. I mean, he, the, my parents didn't have to pick me up and take me, say, he should be walking by now. Can you give him some feet? All right. Born a healthy baby, I had feet. He should be picking up things and throwing them, but, you know, can you, can you install the hands now? You know, especially this part, I think they probably would have bypassed. Can you give him a tongue? He's ready to talk. <laughs> so all that was in my life. It was all present in my physical birth for me to be as a healthy baby, everything I would need to do to be an adult. But it had to be learned. It had to be experienced. It had to be tested. It had to be tried. I had to learn how to crawl. I had to learn how to, to walk before I could ever learn how to run. So are you with me on this? Everything I had, I had on board. The same is true in your second birth. When you were born again, if you were born again, you received all things necessary for you to be a godly, mature, spiritual person. But we know, obviously, we're immature. The Bible says we're like babes still, so we desire the sincere milk of the word that we can grow by. I think, unfortunately, that's where the church, for the most part, is stuck in the culture we live in. We're still treating people like babies. All too often, I've watched too many Christian TV shows and watched programming where I felt like I was in children's church instead of adult church, you know, as I was listening to the preacher talk. We've kind of dumbed down the gospel, it seems to so, instead of challenging people to come up and to grow and to be deeper and to be mature. We always want to be challenged you to go farther, you know, to climb a little higher up that mountain and to be, to be a little more in, exceeding and excelling in your growth process than what you have been. But I think the, the, what I want to make the point this morning is that victory in your life is really the norm. It shouldn't be the abnorm. Because of what God's already done for us, 
because how he's equipped us, and if you follow this passage, it talks about his word and his spirit working in us. And, the, and if you follow the whole letter of 1 Peter through, the whole idea is that God's given you what you've needed. You just need now to do your active part in believing and receiving and trusting God. Paul's talking about a disappointment when he gets to trials. Things aren't what he expected them to be. But then he writes these words in verse 14, but thanks be to God. Praise God for that glorious but found in many places of the scripture. Amen. But, but, but. It was this way, but God. It was this way, but God. You were this way, but God. You were lost, but God saved you. Over and over you see that throughout the word of God, but God. Thank God for those two words in scripture. You may be experiencing defeat in your spiritual life. You need to realize these two words, but God. You may experience a continued defeat in some area of your life, but you have to come back to these words, but God. We don't have to live that kind of life. That scripture tells us in this passage, thanks be to God who always calls us to triumph. Now, I know if you're like me, especially in the early days of reading scripture, trying to grasp things, I'd read a lot of these passages and say, oh, that's a praise the Lord, victory. And, and, and I'd see these glorious promises, but then I would realize that's not where I was. You, you ever notice the point of reality versus the point where God says what his reality is? And sometimes there's this chasm or there's this gap, you know, how are you going to bridge that? Here's what the Bible says, but here's where I am. Here's what the Bible says I, I am, but here's what I seem to be acting like. Is that, do some of those verses ever bother you? When he uses words like, but God calls us always to triumph in all places. That's a powerful hallelujah. But if I'm not triumphing where I am at that moment, forget about the all times and all the places. Amen. There's just verses like that. I remember first time I kind of got a hold of this verse in, in, in 1 John 5, 14, where he says, everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory. That word is Nike, by the way. That has overcome the world, our faith. Oh, come on. I'm born of God and I'm not overcoming the world. You, you ever get honest like that, it helps, by the way, right? <laughs> Seems that the world's overcome me. How am I not overcoming the world? It's our victory that overcomes. What is our victory? The Bible says everybody that's born again, that's pretty much, isn't that pretty much what it says? If you know Jesus, if he's in your life, then you're an overcomer and you've overcome the world. You say, come on, I'm not overcoming the world. I'm giving in to all these different things. I'm not overcoming the world. So what is it? It's pretty simple. It's our faith. Oh, that's it. I just need more faith. No, that's not what it says. It says if you have saving faith, you have overcoming faith. Do I need to say that again? <laughs> if you have enough faith to be saved, you've got enough faith to overcome. You have what you need now. Now, it helps us to understand that because it helps us get away with all the excuses that we have. You can't sit back and say, I don't have enough faith because it says if I have this saving faith and I've got the overcoming faith. You can't sit around and say, okay, God, I just need a holy zap today. If I can get a holy zap and I can feel something. Some of you come to church on Sunday morning waiting for the feeling part to arrive and it doesn't arrive. And you walk out of the well, I don't guess God was there. Your walk with God didn't have anything to do with your feelings, all right? Just junk that mindset. I have to feel something. We're already sitting around waiting. Maybe we'll be in the right place at the right time. I remember even as an early Christian, I thought, I just need to go hear that preacher. And if I could hear that preacher and I could be in the service when he's preaching and he's going to give me that particular Holy Ghost word. And then I'm going to, I'm going to, it's, it's just going to, the lights are going to come on and I'm going to maybe even walk down the aisle and have the right preacher lay his right hand on my right head and whatever. And all of a sudden it's just going to be wonderful and I'm just never going to have problems again in my life. You ever feel that way? I never met that preacher, by the way. There's some out there who say they are that preacher, but even when I did hear them, it didn't work. Because <laughs> that's not what it's all about. That's nothing in this verse about that. He says here that we are overcomers. That is the word Nike, where he talks about victory. That's an important word in the, in the Greek language. I know we have tennis shoes named after that. All right? But this is an actual word from the Greek language. It has to do with our victory, and it's a, it's a, it's a victorious victory. Look at verse eight, uh, in Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What things? All the difficulties, all the struggles, all the problems, all the issues. He said that we are more than conquerors. That word, more than conquerors, is a portion of the word Nike. It's Hooper Nike. That's not the actual Greek pronunciation, but I can't say it the way it should be said anyway, so we'll just leave it at that. But the, the word, whenever they put this word H-U-P-R in it before a word, it means, it means more than or over and above. It's Hooper Nike. All right? 
So that we are, we're, we have, we're experiencing not just victory. He says we're experiencing super victory. Now, I had enough trouble with the first verse. Now I had to look at the next verse. And not only am I a conqueror, I'm more than a conqueror. Well, I felt like a little bit of a coward and probably a little bit more than a coward at times. Amen. I just, I was having trouble getting a grip on this. And it's, it's amazing. We, we, we read these passages and like with the armor, we say, I'm all suited up for the battle. And then we get out there where the front lines are, even though we're suited up, we're prepared spiritually, there's just something that seems to be just missing in the whole things. We don't understand that we are more, already are more than conquerors. We, we haven't got that part down. We haven't learned to live by this, this aspect of faith living. We're, we're really trusting what God told us. And you see Paul experience it. Things weren't right out here. There was a mess in trouts. It wasn't what it's supposed to be. But God immediately turns to the Father, immediately turns with an attitude of thanksgiving. But thanks be to God. In other words, I haven't lost the victory just because circumstances aren't right. Most Christians are waiting for the circumstances to change. They think somewhere in the final minutes of the game that we're, Christians are going to kick a field goal and win the Super Bowl. You know, that somehow this is going, you know, it's going to work out. But why is it in our, in our life when we really get honest with God, the Bible says one thing, but yet we're experiencing another thing. Now, I've probably, I went back and I looked how many times I preached in this passage over the years, I, I keep a running catalog of everything I've preached in 30 years here at the church. And I did notice this will probably be the fourth time that I've preached out of this passage. And it's usually they're about seven, eight, nine years apart when I preached on it. But I couldn't think of a more appropriate passage to come back to. The Bible says anyway, we learn by repetition. To come back to, to conclude this particular series of messages up with. Because just as Paul went to Trous. Carrying the armor of God, all real suited up, things didn't work out. But he didn't take off the armor, he didn't lay his sword down, he didn't give up. He stood on a promise of victory, he stood, and he makes a very clear declaration, thanks be to God, always cause to triumph in every place. Even here in trials, when things don't seem right, it's still right because I'm trusting God. And I think what we're talking about here is, is what I've called in the past a principle of spiritual conquest or the law of spiritual conquest. I think the first time I preached in this past, I called it the secret. By the way, if you read the Bible, there's really no secrets. All right. <laughs> God's not keeping secrets from us. All right. Now, I know we like to use that in sermon titles or even book titles. I don't even know the secret. What's the secret? Everybody likes the secret. Well, God's pretty much made this open to us. If we'll take time to read what the Bible has to say, there's real no secret here. But it is a strong principle that we have to learn and have to remind ourselves of if we're going to be strong in our walk with God and if we're going to experience the victory in our life. Because I do believe there's probably some folks who walked in here this morning who understand all the principles of this, but some little element has kept it from becoming a reality in their life. And I think that little element is found in this passage of Scripture when he says, hey, but thanks be to God who always causes us, as King James, New Mexico says, who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests to us the sweet aroma of life, the, uh, of the knowledge of him in every place. The key to all this is where he says he leads us in his triumph. He leads us in what? His triumph. Now, when it talks about a triumph, it's not saying he leads us in his victory. This is an actual event that took place in the time of Paul when, the, when, the, when Rome ruled the world. They had these big parades that were called a triumph. And this is what he's making reference to. Corinthians thoroughly knew what he was talking about. The church knew what he was talking about. This, that he's talking about... Christ leads us in this celebrative cele celebration parade, this celebration event. Now, what a triumph was in, 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 in the time of Rome. It was a time where, when a conquering general would come back from his conquest. They would have a great celebration as, his, as, his, as he would come into the city with his spoils of war and with the slaves that were collected. And it was a celebration event that took, it lasted about 24 hours. It was a major event. When the Rome, when Roman armies would come to Rome, they would camp out on the hills before they would go in to, to, to make this parade event. In fact, they would send messengers all on ahead, and the messengers would run into the city and run into the Senate and run into the pagan temples everywhere, shouting, Nike, Nike! And they would announce whoever, what general it was that had won this great battle. And the people would prepare for about two days before the general would make his entry. Historians tell us that at least 320 triumphal processions took place in the beginning of Rome until the reign of Vespasian, Vespasian, which was in 403 AD. 
They said the last of these triumphs, history teaches, happened under the Emperor Heronius, who pretty much enjoyed the last truly Roman triumph for Roman, the Roman Empire completely crumpled. But this celebration, as I said, lasted about a day. And during which this time, uh, the Roman people would, would fill the streets with this celebration and glorious tales of the conquest of the general. And then the conquering general would make his, his triumphal entry into town. And the whole event was what was called the triumph. As he came into the city riding in his big chariot, you know, pulled by the six, eight beautiful white stallions that would pull along his chariot. He'd be standing there. Beside him might be his children or his wife dressed in white linen. They'd be riding with the conquering general. There'd be one of his subordinates or slaves that would stand behind him holding a golden crown just over his head and whispering in his ear that all glory is feeding, fleeting, just to remind him. And as he would trail along the pathway of the parade, there would be slaves in front People who'd been conquered, chained and leading and in front of them would be priests bearing censers of, 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 of aromic herbs and spices and herbs were being laid in the streets. The censers were filled with incense from the temples. So this fragrance would waft all the way through the parade. You knew something was going on. There was a celebration happening. People were dancing in the streets. As the army made its way through town, behind those next set of slaves would be most likely chariots filled with the spoils of war. Behind them would be the soldiers and more soldiers and more soldiers as people made their way back in. Families would be re reunited with their warriors. And so it's, it's a great event. And it was called a Roman triumph. Jesus tells us in this passage of scripture that you and I are riding in the wake of his triumph. That we're in league with the one who's the general in charge. We're not riding in the white chariot. He is. We're enjoying the celebration and the victory. And everybody's pointing to General Jesus as he leads us in his triumph. Thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, it says in the e ESV. The, the Conabare translation says, who leads me on in the train of his triumph from place to place. Professor Wymouth put it this way. He translated this verse like, who in Christ ever leads us in his triumphal procession? The Moffat translation, the New Testament put it this way. Wherever I go, thank God, he makes my life a constant pageant of triumph in Christ. Man, what a verse, amen? amen? To think about it in that scenario of rejoicing and celebration, that we're just following Jesus in the parade. That's where we experience the victory. He's leading us in his triumph. We ought to be enjoying the glory of what God has done. He leads us. So as he comes into town, all the attention are on, is, are on him. The eyes are all focused on the general. And there he is in all his splendor and all his grandeur as everybody's focusing on him and all the talk is of him. That is the way our Christian spiritual life should be. We're always pointing to Jesus. We're always looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. And we're always staying in a follow mode. We're always following Christ. And when we fail, it's because we quit focusing on him. And when we fail, it's because we quit, we quit following him and we start following some other deviated path along the journey of our lives. But the victory and the principle of the victory is always found in him and in submission to him. That's really the law of spiritual conquest. If you want to be an overcomer, you must first be overcome. You have to submit to Christ. This illustration becomes clear when this, there was this Roman centurion who comes to Jesus and wants his slave healed. And he said, and, but Jesus said, well, I'll come and I'll heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. What was, what was, what was the moment? What was it that so amazed Christ that he would stand back with this heathen not a child of Israel, all right? not a son or daughter of Abraham, but with this pagan Roman centurion say, I haven't found this kind of faith anywhere in Israel. 
What was so profound about what this man said? It's in the terminology that he's speaking to Jesus with when he identifies and says he understands the authority that Jesus has been given. He says, I too am a man under authority. He recognized that the authority of Jesus was powerful and supernatural and incredible and spiritual, that he was under the authority of God and that Jesus was operating under the authority of his heavenly father. He uses the illustration of his own life. I, too, am a man under authority. Well, whose authority are you under? I'm under the authority of the greatest empire on the globe today, and that's the Roman Empire. There's a time when this man pledged his allegiance. He took the vow. He took the oath and became a Roman soldier. And there was a time in the process of his honor and his allegiance and his commitment to Rome that that was recognized, his faithfulness recognized, and he became a centurion. So now he has this place of authority. Why does he have authority? Because he submitted to the authority. There was a moment in his life when he pledged his allegiance to Rome. He kissed the scepter of Caesar. He was given the responsibilities over a certain number of men, ruling over them, telling them what to do. He said, when I tell one of my soldiers, go do this, he does it. Why? Because there's more to me, the mindset is, than meets the eye. <clears throat> when he looks at me, He's looking at Caesar. My authority is delegated from the empire of Rome. So I'm not operating under my name or my authority. I'm operating under Rome's authority. Even my servant, when I tell him to do this, do it, and he does it. So the secret to his authority was he submitted to authority. And the same principle is true for us. The secret to me having authority in my life is to submit to authority. The Lordship of Jesus Christ is the first and foremost authority I submit to. And then I submit, as Scripture instructs me to submit, on the other areas of submission and authority that he would have me to do so. And as I do that, I have authority in my life. Just as the centurion said, he had authority because he was submitted to authority. I think all too often what we want the parade to be about is us, not Jesus. We want to be the one riding in the golden chariot, you know, pulled by the white horses with every eyes on us. We are not the sovereign Jesus is. We're not the center of attention Jesus is. Our life now is in his hands and his life is in us, praise the Lord. But we live our life, according to what the centurion did, in a life of yieldedness. So the essence of real victory for me to experience, when Paul starts his letter in, a, in that part of the letter to the Ephesians about armies, it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. How in the world am I going to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might? I'm going to submit to the Lord. I'm going to surrender to the Lord. I'm going to let, this may be a novel idea, the Lord be the Lord of my life. He's the commander in chief. He's the general in charge. He's the one that makes the, makes the difference in my life. So I am submitting it's not my victory first and foremost. It's his victory. He won it at the cross. He displayed it at the resurrection. It's his victory. But it's mine because he's given it. He say, what's the big difference? That's just, you're just playing you know, semantics of the words. What is that? The difference is this. The responsibility for victory in my life now rests with him, not me. All too often we spend our life in performance mode versus a participation mode. Performance mode, you wake up like this. I'm going to be a good Christian today. I'm going to put on the whole armor of God. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to be what God. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Dave. Feel the Spirit. I'm just going to, you know. But then we go out and we try to, imp I think, maybe even impress the Lord with how good we are <laughs> or show him how serious we are or we really do love him. Or, and we get so preoccupied with what we're doing that we're not really participating in his life. We're not really fellowshipping. We're kind of trying to, you know, work on this little merit-based thing. We forget that we're really under grace. We don't have to prove anything. Amen. And it frees us now to really spend our time participating with him and loving him and walking with him and enjoying him. And our service becomes more, now not a performance kind of service, and now become more just an outflow of our fellowshipping with him. Do you understand that? There's a vast difference between freedom there and victory in our life. 
We can realize now that he's responsible for my victory. I am supposed to submit, but I'm going to submit to him. And my focus is now upon him. It now means that the responsibility for my success doesn't lie in my best effort. It lies with him. And I'm leaning on him. Now, it does not mean that I'm irresponsible. It does not mean that I'm passive. I'm just going to kick it in gear. I'm just going to trust the Lord and do nothing and be nothing. A good illustration of this is in the Old Testament when Moses is leading the millions of Jews out of Egypt and they've come across the way and, you know, Pharaoh's giving them permission, get out of here, I'm done with you guys, you can go. And so they're leaving and they get to the Red Sea and they're, guess what, they're, what, what is there? A Red Sea. Well, I'm thinking I'm going to get there. In my mind, God's led me out. Certainly he's going to make a way through the Red Sea, but there's no way through the Red Sea. And then I look over my shoulder, and here's the whole of the Egyptian army trailing me. All you see is the dust on the horizon from the thousands of Egyptian warriors that are coming to kill us or take us back to slavery. It reminds you, by the way, the devil is a liar, just like Pharaoh was. He might tell you, oh, yeah, go do that. But yeah, don't ever lean on him or trust him for anything. He's always going to lie to you. And they get up there, and then Moses gets off, apparently behind a rock or something. He has a little quiet place. He gets with the Lord. You know, I said, by the way, Lord, I don't know if you paid attention, but, you know, the Egyptians are coming. And we got this one little issue we'd like to go for, but there's a Red Sea out there. Listen, because we get dressed for battle and because we realize that we're victors in Christ, doesn't mean there's not going to be Red Seas. All right? Well, what do you want me to do? I want you to raise up your, 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 I want you to raise the rod of God up, which is our, for us is the promises of God. I want you to believe my promise and get your feet wet if you need to. Step out there. It's not going to part until you get in it. It was the same thing when Joshua crossed the Jordan. In fact, they had to wait out and get, the, get up into their, almost to their knees before it started parting. You've got to wade into the water sometime. But you'll get across the water. It's not going to overcome you. That's, that's trusting in the authority of God. And we think, oh, well, by faith, I'll just build a boat. <laughs> no. Or by faith, I'll go around. It's a long way around, but I'll get around this thing sooner or later. God says, go straight forward. That's what we mean to go, go straight forward. Another illustration, that's David and Goliath. We know the story well. Here's Goliath. He's taunting the armies of God. For 40 days, I think he was out there taunting the armies of God, challenging people. No one came forward until little David shows up with a slingshot. And David walks out there with an attitude of faith, you know, and he just moves forward and says, hey, you know, this day God's going to deliver you into my hand. The battle is the Lord's. That's, that's the faith. That's the, that's, that's the required, and that's the faith that God gave us when we got saved. Let, let, me, let me simplify this a little bit further. If you can trust God to save your soul, give you eternal life, deliver you from an eternal hell, don't you think you can trust God to meet your needs? (laughs) Everything else is puny compared to that if you ask me. All right? That's a big one to get over. You say, I got some big problems. Not as big as that one was. I got issues in my family. Not as big as that one was. Well, I got problems I'm facing in my life. There's mountains, brother. Not as big as that one was. And if God loved you enough to send his son to die for you, Romans says, will he not also through his own son provide for you the things that you need in life? You don't stop and say, I'm a trial. It's not working out. Nothing. not what I expected it to be. I just want to go back home. Or bail out and discouragement and fear or defeat. No, you you say, I will continue to thank God. I will continue to trust God. Because God at this point is the point where he comes through and shows himself mighty in my life. God says, listen, those Egyptians behind you, you're not going to see them anymore. Just keep moving forward. Move forward. That's the simple responsibility of of just staying focused on Christ. The simple responsibility of loving Jesus throughout the day. The simple responsibility when all the alternative voices start whispering in your ear what you need to do, what you ought to do, what you have to do. What you, you just keep following Jesus. You keep your mind focused. You keep your heart set. And you, keep, you, keep, you keep responding to him. And it'll be the same that God promised to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, when verse 3, when he told him, hey, every place, the sole of your footsteps, you'll have victory there. But you got to step. Every place your foot hits... You can't sit back and, oh, that, that's a big storm or that's a big problem. or that, No way we can get around. You just walk. But you walk 
committed to Christ and you walk with your focus on Jesus and you discover at that point that the essence of victory is really just in Christ. He has everything you need to get by. You know what the problem is? We get into the, get into the triumph and we're following through and we were celebrating like everybody else. And then some little imp, some little demon, some little minion on the side, some element of the world or even our own flesh says, psst, psst, hey, you in the parade, look over here. And there it goes. Look at this. You want to see what I got? And he goes, come over here and watch this. You got it. Or look at this. All right. Another guy on the other side. Hey, come over here. You got to taste this. You got to try this. And by the way, everybody else is doing it. Right, everybody? everybody? Yeah, we're all doing this great. Come on, too. That's the, that's the only thing that, that keeps you from walking in victory. These little things along the pathway that appeal to our flesh or appeal to our desires and try to draw us away from, the, from God's will and God's way and God's word. And we just bite onto it. Oh, well, here, this is my sword, my shield. You hold that for a minute, I'll be back. <laughs> no, that's when you lift up the shield. That's when you hold up the word of God. This is your responsibility and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing, this is the extent of our victory. This is one that gave me most trouble when I got first got saved. It says this triumph, this victory or parade was always in every place. Now, that just covers pretty much everything about my life. So they kind of shot all our excuses right down the tubes, right? How often? Always. Where? Everywhere. Which place? Sunday church? Yeah, it's a great place. But what about Monday work? That place too. What about traffic? That place too. What about me and my wife are getting ready to get into something big discussion? We used to call those arguments. We call them discussions after you get married. <laughs> there too always in every place but let me back up I think I need to say one more thing about that <laughs> your life is made up of two things those two things time and space it's pretty much it isn't it it's all time and space now, in our eternal bodies and heaven, it's, it's going to be completely different. There'll be no more time. Space won't be an issue. We'll be moving at the speed of light. I mean, it's just going to be glorious things in these new glorified bodies. It'll be like Jesus was after the resurrection. You know, he wants to go to Galilee. Man, he's there in seconds. You know, he wants to be somewhere else. He, he has to get in the building. He didn't have to open the door. He just goes right in. He just goes right through the door. Not when it's open, when it's closed. All right. So you see this, this glorified. It's, that's another world. But right now, even, he says, he'll still meet you at every place. He'll still meet you at, 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 at all the time. Not some of the time, all the time. Not some place, all places. The evidence is another thing. That not only are we celebrating this extended victory, it can be experienced at all times in every place, but there's an evidence to it. He said, we, we become like a sweet aroma, you know, unto God. And he said, and not only to God, and it, it's, when God smells us, we smell good, all right? We should, especially if we're walking in submission. But other believers also, when they smell us, it smells good. Now, he said there are those who are perishing. This is people who don't know Christ. What he simply put in the Joe Arms translation, we read this, and to those that are perishing, you stink. All right? You don't smell good. But this is the life on the altar. This is the life of, of sacrifice. This is the life of submission. Romans 12, when it talks about present your body as a living sacrifice. What happens with sacrifices? Sacrifices are put on the altar, and on the altar they're burnt. There were special offerings that would be placed. There was a, there was a fat offering. Now I don't know about you, when I throw an offering on the on the altar at my house called the barbecue pit, and I throw the fat on there with the meat, in it, it has a great smell. I just love the smell of meat cooking. All right. Apparently, God does too. Okay, so get over it. <laughs> Bacon. Oh, I tell you, it's just marvelous. You know? Women, if you want to, single women, here's a word of advice. Get you some perfume that smells like bacon. <laughs> Every guy in the county will be coming around. Can I get a witness, guys? Doesn't bacon just smell awesome? <laughs> There is a spiritual aroma that comes off our life, though. There's a spiritual aroma when we're around people that are loving Jesus. There's a spiritual aroma, I believe, that's released in our church when we're offering sacrifices of praise and worship. 
That's why there's such an important emphasis that we place at Believer's Fellowship on genuinely worship when we worship. When we're singing songs, that we're genuinely worshiping God. Well, it's not my kind of song. It doesn't matter. It's a song to him. It's about him. It's praised him. So we sing it to him and we honor him. It's not about me and my preferences. You know, people just say, well, Brother Joe, you know, these worship words are going, what kind of music are going to do this? Here? What are you going to be going to say? We're just going to do what pleases Jesus. And if it's about him and it honors him, we're going to worship the Lord. We can worship with hymns. We can worship with It's about our hearts ultimately, is it not, though? Bottom line, will I worship the Lord or not? Guess what happens is I'm worshiping God. And I'm truly. And, and, and I, I, again, it gets back to that part where you kind of, it's that performance thing versus the participation thing we talked about. We're just kind of in a performance. We're singing our part. We got it down and we're doing our thing. And we sound so good to ourselves. Sometimes we want others to hear us and they're going, oh, Lord. <laughs> But when we're, we're really con- interested in not the performance, but the participation, there's an aroma in the atmosphere that those who are saved and know the Lord and are right with, they can smell it. And there's a beautiful aroma that's wafting up to heavens that is a sweet-smelling savor. Listen to what Paul wrote even about the, the Philippians when he wrote to them about their gift to him and what that was. He said, listen, he said, I have all and I abound. And by the way, let me tell you that verse was written while he was in prison. I have all and I abound. I am full. I have received from Epaphroditus all those things which, you were, which were sent from you. And they are an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. Our life becomes a perfume, so to say. And there's two things to say about that. One is about perfume. One is that, first of all, it is pervasive. To those who are lost, it stinks. To those that are saved, it's a sweet smell. To God, it's a sweet smell. But one thing about perfume, it invades the room. At least the distinct area around you. It changes. But not only is it pervasive, it's persuasive. That's why these women wear it many times. (laughs) It's a persuasive smell. He says, to some it's a smell of life. And to others it's a smell of death. But I believe there's this persuasive thing about our life that, that when we're walking in triumphal with Jesus and we're in that triumphant march with him and we're following in him and our lives are committed to him and we're suited up in serving him, participating in his will and purposes in life for us, enjoying Jesus, just making a, a, a commitment that I'm going to enjoy Jesus today and fellowship with him, that it is a persuading influence around us. That people be influenced for Christ. People be caused to come under conviction even, I believe, that don't know Christ. And there will always be those who resist it. But it's an amazing thing what God does in our life and the the way he empowers our life when we're just walking with him. Not only to be a a major difference in my heart's been made, but a difference in other people's lives can be made as I'm following along. John 16, 33, Jesus says, You know, I've spoken these things unto you that you might have peace in the world you're going to have troubles, tribulation. Oh, thanks a lot. (laughs) But be of good cheer. Excuse me, you just said I got troubles. Why should I be of good cheer? Because I've overcome the world, and you follow along in that triumph. I've overcome, so you can overcome. 1 John 4, 4 says, you're of God, little children, and you have overcome them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Revelation 17, 14 These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For the Lamb, He is the Lord of lords, the King of kings. And they that are with Him, those who are following along in that triumph, they are the called, they're the chosen, they're the faithful. Take a moment to reflect, just for a moment here. Not just on the message, but I'm talking about this week. If you look back over your life just this week, even if you haven't got that long-term memory, last few days at least, Look, look over your life, and first of all, let's, let's point to any area of failure. You just, you just feel like you blew it. Just be honest with yourself about that. Could it have been that the failure was there because you chose to depart at some place from that following and submission and enjoying the celebration of Jesus' victory? And you listen to one of those little things on the side, drawing you over, pulling you away. Instead of realizing you had all the authority of the world to hold up your sword and shield and keep marching. Same hand. Let's look at your successes. Your real successes this week came in the lie of the fact of those moments when you were following 
and you were participating and enjoying the Lord Jesus Christ. Pretty much breaks down that way, doesn't it? If we just get honest. So the lesson's pretty simple. Victory is ours to be enjoyed, to be experienced, because the essence of my victory is not my abilities, not my power, it's not my strength, it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. The extent of my victory because of that, it can be in every place all the time. The evidence is there's something pervasive and persuasive about my walk and my life and my talk for the glory of God. If there's resistance, you're not going to experience that. You have to surrender to Christ. You can't resist him. Usually, if we get real honest about these things, it's a transforming moment. If we don't get real honest about them and we just kind of go through church motions, I can guarantee you, you'll get stuck over here in the performance slot where you're just trying to do something all the time to make up for it. That's not the way to live your life. One, because that's not grace. Grace, God just says, bring that failure to me. I'll forgive it and I'll cleanse it. That's grace. Grace is not only saying, come bring to me, I'll, 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 I'll cleanse it and forgive it. Grace also says, and I'll empower you to overcome it. Amen. Where did I experience it? Quit. Leave your feelings, please, at the altar. <laughs> I think I think that what is the victory that overcomes the world? Even our faith. Keep trusting. Keep following. Keep believing. That's where your victory is. Yes. I'm, I'm glad it's that simple, folks. Because I can confuse about everything in my life given an opportunity. <laughs> Let's stand together.